Amen. And praise the Lord. Good morning. Hope you came to have church today. Got over here a little earlier than usual this morning, and it's good to have everybody praising the Lord and worshiping God. Amen. We didn't come to church to sit around and be dead, did we? So you may be dead Baptist, but we're not dead Baptist. So praise the Lord. My Bible's upside down. It's the way I've been feeling most of the day today. So it's good to see you. We're continuing our series of messages. We talk about the miracles of Jesus today, and we've been going through this series of messages for about 12, 13 weeks. As we get into this part of the sermon today, it may seem uh, like it's a kind of a repeat of what we've done before, but it isn't. There was one announcement I was going to make at the end, but let me go ahead and make it right now. You'll notice in your bulletin, it talks about party planners and stuff. This year marks 25 years of us uh, celebrating 25 years as a church. Praise the Lord. 25 years ago, this church was born, and uh, since that time, we've been just having a great time. But we want to have a great and grand celebration for our 25th uh, birthday party. So we want you to uh, be a part of that as well. As big a party as we're planning, it takes a lot of people to put it all together. So I want to encourage you today to take that insert out of your bulletin, take a moment, and fill it out. We need to get these turned in today, all right? We put them out last week. We're also putting them out today. This is important. We have a lot of committees we're putting together to make this thing happen and to pull it all off. We're going to need a lot of people participating. So, hey, it's going to be a lot of fun. Come on, get signed up, be a part of what's going on, and let's have a glorious blast together. It's going to be a, a great day in the Lord. We're going to... We're expecting to have the highest attendance we've ever had. It's going to be homecoming week as well as uh, celebration week for all that the Lord's done in 25 years. So there's going to be a lot of, a lot of fun, a lot of reminiscing, a lot of ministry, a lot of praising the Lord. Uh, we're going to have dinner on the grounds, all kinds of activities. But with all that's going on, the more people we have helping us, it will be the better. So uh, if you're enjoying Believer's Fellowship and you want to participate and help us, we can't get too many people signing up. Take a moment to, to take this card out of your bulletin and get it filled up. Say, I don't even know where I'd like to serve. Just put me down for something. And in a few weeks, probably by next week or the week after, we'll be letting you know about the dates we'll set for a kind of a, a meeting and we'll all get together and hash it all out and, and get it all taken care of and then we'll move forward from there. But September is the date that we're going to do that, the end of September, the last Sunday of September. So be sure, we've got to start planning it now. I know some of you think September's a long way. Uh, it's not. It's just around the corner. So get signed up, come be a part of what we've got going on. Praise the Lord. I know they're having trouble and fun with the computer. Maybe they can catch up to us as we go today. But uh, I want to talk about, as we said, the miracles of Jesus. This is part 12. We're called, last week we did the, the part 11, which was the feeding of the multitudes. Remember where the Lord uh, came and had compassion on the multitudes and, and fed them. There was a, a boy there who had his lunch, and he took the lunch and divided it amongst everybody. And uh, it, was, it was the first feeding of the multitude that we have in Scripture. In fact, it's the only miracle that's recorded in all the Gospels. We talked about it, so how important that was. Well, this is the second feeding. And now, we read from Matthew 14 last week, so we're just seeing the time lapse of a chapter go by. It may have been several weeks. We don't exactly know how much time has gone by in the ministry of Jesus. But the time has gone by, and uh, you could almost title this, What? You didn't get it? Because as you reread this, you'll see it almost duplicates, and you would have thought, hey, these guys have been there. It's kind of like you say, Yoga Bear used to say, it's deja vu all over again. You think they'd remember what the Lord did the last time, but as, as us, so were they. We have a tendency to quickly forget how big God is and just all that God can do. You ought to say amen to that. Sometimes we forget just how big God is and how all that God can do when we've seen him do so many things in the past. So in Matthew 15, we'll start with verse 32. And we're going to read through verse 39. And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the multitude because they have remained with me now three days and they have nothing to eat. I do not wish to send them away hungry lest they faint or pass out on the way. And the disciples said to him, uh, where would we get so many loaves? in a desolate place to satisfy such a multitude. And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few small fish. And he directed the multitude to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and the fish and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples and disciples in turn gave them to the multitudes. And they all ate 
and were satisfied, and they picked up what was left over, the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. And those who ate were 4,000 men, besides the women and children, and sending away the multitudes, he got into the boat and came to the region of Magadan. Now, folks, this, again, it seems like a repeat of what they've just seen happen before. But uh, I think the emphasis is here for more reasons than what we probably know. There's two things I really want to look at this morning. We look at this miracle. Of course, you know me. There'll be 42 things under those two things. One is the principal lesson here is that faith is integral. You must learn this lesson. And until we learn this important lesson, we're going to keep suffering in so many areas of our life. Faith is is a primary, it is importance, it is the utmost importance. Number two, not only is it integral, it is also practical. It's not a hard thing to do, it's, it's not difficult. In fact, it is very simple. The disciples must get this lesson down because they're going to be faced with the impossible task, not just feeding thousands of people, they're going to be facing the impossible task of starting the church and carrying the message of the gospel to the world. Now, feeding a few thousand people is nothing in comparison to that. It's going to take something. But also, I want us to catch from this today just how important and practical faith really is. That when we get a word from God, it's to be heard, but not only heard, it's to be understood and it's to be obeyed. And too often, we're, we're satisfied with just hearing or we're satisfied with just knowing something. And we don't get the lesson fully. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. But the first thing is this lesson. The principle of faith, the principle lesson is one of faith and it is integral. The most important thing you'll learn once you come to Jesus Christ, by the way, that's by faith, you put your trust in him, is your continued walk with him. Now, the Matthew, as he writes this gospel to us, we've moved away from the place where people are seeking to understand that Jesus is Messiah and there's a lot of acceptance. We talked about last week, now the, the politics are against him and also the religious people are against him. And now some of the multitudes are turning away from following him. And there's a lot of emphasis in the book of Matthew on the rejection of Jesus as Messiah at this point. And the most important lesson that the disciples have to learn and get a grip of is it doesn't matter what the politicians say. And it doesn't matter what the religious leaders say. It really matters what God says and who Christ is. And it's important that they understand that he is the Messiah. And though everyone else turns away, they must stay consistent. You remember, it's at this point in time in John when a great multitude turn away from following Jesus and the disciples say, hey, what you're telling them, these are hard sayings. Because he was talking about sacrifice and commitment and basically giving up all to follow Jesus. And he turns to the disciples and he said, will you also go? And there are those great words from the, the apostles said, you know, we have nowhere else to go. You have the words of life. You know, you're, you're the only way to go, ultimately. You are the answer for, for everything. We don't have any place to go. So he wants them to get this lesson. Now, the bread, the fish, the loaves, that's all just a practical lesson. And the greater lesson, you've got to trust and you've got to believe. What's the old hymn that says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to. That's the lesson. Can we trust? And in trusting, it leads to obedience. Because again, there's a lot of folks who get it down in their head, but the obedience part and the, and the application of it in their life is just missed too often. So here they are. Now it's time for them to trust, and now it's time for them to obey, but they're at a point where they aren't necessarily getting the lesson. In fact, verse 33 says, and the disciples said to him, uh, where can we get uh, some food? It's desolate out here. Now again, this almost reads like Matthew chapter 14. It's desolate. In fact, remember in Matthew 14, Jesus has started early in the day talking about the need to feed the people. And it's not till later in the afternoon that they actually get around to it because he wants them to absorb the, uh, and to understand the important lesson here hey, that, the, that, the, that the bread of life is standing right before you. And if you have Jesus, you have what you need. And he is, is able to meet that particular need. But they're just not quite getting it all right here. In fact, their reluctance at this point almost uh, constitutes a, a form of rejection. Whereas the leadership has rejected him, political and religious, uh, for them to say, well, you know, after seeing everything they've seen, for them to say, well, I don't know how we're going to do that, is, is almost an absolute form of rejection as well. 
Now, we understand. We all know that for you to have salvation, all right, if I don't want to die and go to hell, but I want to die and go to heaven, have eternal life, then it means I have to believe what God has promised me through his son, that Jesus came, died for the sins of the whole world, that I can put my faith in Christ, repent of my sins, and trust him as my Lord and Savior, and I can be saved. That's just the first step of faith living. I give my life to Christ. Now we're called to a whole life of faith living. Every day should be where I'm trusting the Lord. Every commitment is in his name. My obedience is because I love him and because I trust him. If I'm not obeying, can I put it simply, I'm not really loving and I'm not really trusting. So what we're having here is this, kind of, it's this element of, well, you know, I know what you've done before, but. But my situation is different. You know, before we had a kid with some bread and fish. We don't have the kid here. We got some fish and bread, but it's, it's such a little deal. We don't have enough. And, you know, I mean, what are these? They say, what is this few loaves of bread? And, these, and I love the way you put few small fishes, you know. Isn't it amazing the Lord calls on us, how we just minimize everything, our, our abilities and our capacities. Oh, I just can't do that. Uh, I would like to help, but who am I? I want to do something, but I really don't have a lot to offer. You know, I can't sing and I can't preach and I'm, I'm, not as, I'm not handsome or I'm not beautiful or I'm too big or I'm not big enough or I'm too small or I'm not large. Enough. On and on it goes. What is this with such a demanding situation as the world dying and going to hell? What can I offer? So I'm not going to offer anything. That's where these, this is the hump these guys I got to get over. God has chosen the least. God has chosen the weak. God has chosen the foolish. This is a lesson of trust. This is a lesson of faith. And the Bible says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You say, what do you mean? I mean that everything in my life comes back to this point. Am I going to trust God? My relationship to my wife, God gives me in his word. He tells me how I should treat my bride. Very clearly, right? It's all right there. And if I do not, then what is it? It's really unbelief. If I, if I don't obey what the God is talking about in relationship in regard to my wife, then it's unbelief. But w w what about in regard to my finances? Well, God's told me how I can relate to my finances and how I can properly live according to his word in regard to my finances. But if I reject what he said and said, well, what is, what, this needs too big. I'm just nobody. I ain't got nothing. It's not going to make a big deal anyway. And I, don't, I can't afford it. Whatever the excuse might be, then it's unbelief. All right. It, it, are you agree with me? Let's move to the other side. A woman in regard to her husband. God tells you how to relate to your husband if, if you're a married woman in this room today. And should you not do that, should you ignore that, no matter what the excuse is, hey, well, it's, well, I can't, you know, whatever it might be, then it's still unbelief, is it not? Isn't it amazing that in, in, when, you, when you look at Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about all these great people of faith. In the context of Hebrews chapter 11 and chapter 12, the Bible says they didn't, they didn't receive and they, they didn't experience the fullness of God's blessings that God had for the children of Israel. They didn't get to go in into the promised land, but a whole generation of them died away because they wouldn't believe. Now, it doesn't say they didn't get to go in and inherit the land because they murmured, they complained, and they did do those things. And it doesn't say that they didn't get to go into the promised land because of, they made a golden calf. They did do that. It doesn't say they didn't get to go into the promised land because they were adulterers and fornicators and living immoral lives. They did that. But the Bible says they didn't get to go in because they had an evil heart of unbelief. See, all that sin really just means is that I'm just choosing not to believe God. I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. That's an evil heart of unbelief. That's where we have to come to our life. It, my life really comes down to, am I going to walk with God? Am I going to believe his word? Am I going to trust Jesus? Am I going to do my thing out here, which is just, you know, it, can, it can come under a lot of different names for sins. Amen from greed to bitterness to pride to arrogance to drunkenness to immorality, whatever it might encompass, it's still all a belief. I just choose not to believe God. So the lesson comes back again, what are you going to do? You know, Hebrews 11 is that great chapter we call it the heroes of faith, the hall of faith, the hall of fame of faith, or people trusting God. And it says, you know, the, in, in Hebrews it tells us now that you've trusted Christ, here's what you need to do. Lay aside every weight and the sin was to so easily beset us. What sin? So here's, you know, it's this sin. And by the way, I do believe that 
the Holy Spirit of God is, is so good at what he does, all right? He, he's the perfect convictor. He's the perfect teacher. He knows exactly how to speak to your heart beyond me or anyone else. He knows how to speak to you what the sin is. <laughs> but let me tell you what the sin really is. I believe because the context of Hebrews chapter 12 and chapter 11 about being all about faith, that the sin is unbelief. Because whatever the sin is in your life, you can really mark it down to that. You just choose not to believe God. Well, that's just an oversimplification. <laughs> no, it isn't. I, I didn't make it up. He wrote it there. If anybody oversimplified it, he did. The problem is you're trying to make it too complex. You want there to be some other variable to it. Because if there's another variable, then I'm, I have an excuse. I'll take a drink while you think about that. Now, man, it is so quiet in here. Is it too quiet? Somebody say amen. Thank you very much. <laughs> so understand where the disciples are at. And this whole issue about let's do the bread thing again is all about faith. They must believe Messiah. They must believe who he is, and he's the Christ. And it's shortly in this period, and after this period, when you follow through, they get into that scenario where Jesus takes them up, to, to, you know, up on the mountain and talks to them about who do men say that I am. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the message. But I have to believe it in my heart. Is he the Christ, the Son of the living God, in my life, my marriage, my relationships, in my world, in my job? Is he the Christ, the Son of the living God, there? That's the faith part. That's the application part. And that's the part that we have to get down. Now, we said the second part of this message is faith is practical. And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? A uh, seven and a few small fish. Yeah, just seven, I'm sure. It's only seven. 12,000 people here or more probably. 4,000 men alone. If they all brought their wife and one kid, hey, we got 12,000 people here. <laughs> So you know there's 12 to 15,000 people. So hey, it's just a little fish and bread. That's all we got. That's all we have. And he said to them, tell the multitude to sit on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish and he gave thanks and he broke them. He started giving them to the disciples and they in turn, the disciples gave them to the multitudes. So this miracle is taking place. But catch the way it all comes down. We'll just call these little quick steps here the principles of living faith. Not just talking faith. Not just saying, I love Jesus. But really loving Jesus. Not just, not just saying, I, I, I believe God. But do I really believe God? The first of these principles of living faith would be this when he says, what do you have? What's in your hands? What have we got? Let's inventory what do you got? Oh, just. And by the way, I love this part because there's no little boy that shows up to give his little basket of fish and loaves, you know. You say, what's the big deal about that? Hey, it's always easier to give something away that's not yours. They give away his lunch. Of course, he offered it. He gave it to him. And that was in the first miracle. It was somebody else's bread. But now it changes a little bit. Now, let's really get practical with this faith message. What do you have? Ah, just a little bit. What do you have? And if we're not willing to offer what we have, then certainly we don't have any comprehension of what it really means to believe God. If I can't offer my life, if I can't offer my heart, if I can't offer my love, if I can't give my forgiveness, if I can't give my time, if I can't give my treasure, hey, what have I given? Nothing. What do you have? What's in your hands, Mr. Arms? What's in your hands? Because, and again, I believe the Holy Spirit does that so well at work in our lives. We know what he's asking, and we know when he's asking, when he asks us for it. The second part of this is, he takes what you give him. And this is amazing, that he can take such a little amount and make such a vast thing with it. And for us... To withhold from the Lord anything he's asking in our heart and life is for us to just miss the miracle of the moment. Miss what God wants to do in our lives. Miss the deliverance. Miss the freedom. Miss the joy. Miss the peace. Miss the excitement. Miss the adventure. If we just kind of hold on to what we have and say, I'm not going to give it, then we just miss it completely. 
The third thing here, he takes from them and it says he gives thanks. In other words, here's an act in this giving where it all becomes worship. It all becomes worship. And this is where most people miss it, not just in giving financially. I think they miss it in giving in so many areas of their life. That for us, worship is not just singing a few songs on Sunday morning. If we believe what the Bible teaches about worship, then we truly believe that worship is that yielded life, that giving life, that given heart that says, I will do what you tell me to do, when you tell me, how you tell me, where you tell me. I, I'm following you, Jesus. That's the act of worship. And when it's placed in the Lord's hands like that, then whatever it might be, whatever the sacrifice might be, then it becomes a genuine act of worship. I, I, I love reading the Psalms and, and I, I go through them regularly because they're, they just, when I'm, especially when I'm feeling a little down or depressed about things, and I'll open up the Psalms and just get into a little praise service with the psalmist. And, and Psalms 96 is where I opened up to this morning. And, and that's where it says, Sing the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the glad tidings in the nations. And he goes on and on. Great is the Lord. Greatly be praised. He's above all gods. And then it goes down to verse 7 and 8. It says, And so ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name and bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord. But in the context of all this worship, there was this bringing of an offering. How, how often do you see that in, in, through the Psalms or even through different parts of the Scripture where there was some commitment made that, that really was the high point of worship, the, the point of surrender, the point of sacrificing, the point of letting go, then it really becomes worship. Because as long as we're just kind of doing what I can do or what I want to do and I kind of leave off what God is actually saying to do, then it's not worship, it's mere religion. Dead religion. Are you still with me? And I, the, I, the heart of this whole miracle is getting down to the point of what we're talking about here. When are we going to start living in worship? When are, our, when are our actions worship? And this feeding the multitude, although it is a miraculous, again, testimony of the power of God, there's a great lesson the disciples are not, hadn't gotten and he wants them to get. So he gives thanks and catch this. In the midst of all this worship, it says, and as he's giving thanks, he breaks it. And I believe that brokenness is always an imperative because nothing is going to be shared with the multitude until it's broken. Nothing's going to be shared out of our lives until we're broken. The Bible talks about a broken, a contrite heart God won't deny. Why? Because God knows that out of your brokenness comes life and comes grace. Same thing when Jesus Christ was broken and gave his life for us on the cross. Out of the sacrifice and out of his brokenness came forth life. The Bible says that God gave his son and reaped many sons under redemption. And same thing with our lives. And we can present this and there's brokenness in our heart and life. That out of that comes, comes greater life. And God is honored by that greater life, but brokenness has to take place or there's no real sharing. The Bible talks about how brokenness is acceptable and a blessing in the presence of God. It also says this, a wounded spirit who can bear. You see, there's a difference between just being wounded about something and being broken. And perhaps you've just been wounded. Maybe your feelings are hurt. Maybe you've been in a bad situation. And maybe you've been in a bad ordeal. And that woundedness in your life, you cannot just let it stop there and say, I got hurt. You have to let that woundedness progress to brokenness, even in your own heart. And you say, well, they're the guilty ones. It doesn't matter. God still wants you to come to the place of surrender, that you'd surrender that situation even completely to the Lord. Because who can bear a wounded spirit? So we come to the Lord and we present this offering to him as the bread's given to him. It's given thanks over it and he breaks it. And this sharing takes place out of brokenness. You know, it, even in your own family, if there's not brokenness in your relationship, in your own home, it's so easy to become egotistical and proud and the world revolves around you and you become kind of a, a narcissist in life and, 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 and nobody else means anything but you, making sure your needs are met, you're happy, you're satisfied. Well, what about everybody else? Brokenness. That's where fellowship comes in. That's where fellowship in the body comes in. Because Jesus was broken, we share now in a common life with him. In the church, because we can be broken and not arrogant and self-seeking, we can share in a common life. But a person who isolates themselves, many times a person who's not willing to let their, their, their pride be broken. Oh, well, I'm just shy. Hey, that's just another word for proud. 
It is. It's just another face of pride. It has multitudes of masks that it can wear. We come to the place of brokenness and we allow the Lord to bring the breaking. And the fifth thing he says, so he, then he gives it back to the disciples for them to share with the multitudes. And it's great, we, we, the old principle of reaping and sowing, you know, you reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. They gave a little, got back a bunch, and they didn't get back just a bunch to keep, they got back a bunch to share some more. What was it, Bill Stafford has preached here so many times, he says, you know, we become a center of distribution, a warehouse of distribution in our life. We, re- we give so we can receive, so we can give some more, so we receive some more, so we can continue to give some more, so we can receive some more. And just how much can God put in our hands? How much does God trust us with? How much can we be, ex- can, can be, be faithful to God to put back into other people's lives what he's put into our lives? And so many times we're, we said, well, all I've got is this little bit. I can't give anything. But when you take the little bit and you put it in his hands, the little bit becomes a lot more. And it becomes useful. The sixth thing about this, and the final principle of this is this. He gave them back more than they gave away. In verse 37 says, They all ate, they were all satisfied, and they picked up what was left over, broken pieces, seven large baskets full. Now, when we read from Matthew 14 last week and talked about the miracle there, the feeding of thousands, it says they took up 12 baskets full. Now, the word, if you, if you have a little Greek dictionary and you look up the word basket, you'll see that there's a couple of different words in the Greek language for basket. There's one for a little basket, like a little lunch pail basket. That's what the young boy gave. He gave his little basket of, of loaves and fish to the Lord. It was multiplied and fed probably 20 to 25,000 people. Now, the disciples came and they gave a few loaves and fish. And translation of the New American Standard says they took back seven large baskets. But these were the kind of baskets, by the way, that were large for carrying lots of stuff in, all right? These were the baskets you'd see the women carrying up on the head, but just loaded up with all kinds of stuff. You know, they were large baskets full. So this wasn't just a little bit of bread they were talking about, or even 12 little baskets of bread. This was a greater miracle than the other miracle. In fact, that what they kept back, you know, there was more than what they can even imagine. Seven large baskets. It's full. And again, remember, how many people have already been fed? Minimum probably 12,000. Maximum up to 15 to 20,000. But again, let me go back to this. The, re- the re- repetition of this miracle shows, you know, that the disciples aren't getting it. They hadn't been keeping up. And the last thing that you and I want to be in our life is behind when we follow Jesus, we want to be up close and personal. We want to be right there. They said that a true disciple is, you know, has the, the dust from the master's sandals on his feet as well. You know, the dust he's kicking up is right on you. You don't want to be following 12 paces, 6 paces, 7 paces behind. You want to be right there. Jesus is about the greatest thing, the greatest event in history is unfolding before them. They need to be front and center. Hey, The second greatest thing since then, since the first coming of Jesus, is the second coming of Jesus. We are living in those days. We should be closer to Christ than we've ever been. The apostles wrote, seeing that all these things shall come to pass. All those prophecies concerning the return of the Lord Jesus. Seeing that all these things are going to happen. What kind of impact should it make on our life? How much more should we be pure? How much more should we be in step? How much closer should we be to Christ because all the events that are taking place in the world around us? We shouldn't be so slow to believe. We shouldn't be so slow to act. We ought to be on the front line in the battle, you know, right up next to the forces of hell if necessary because that's where Jesus is moving forward. The gates of hell will not prevail against us, which means they're not coming after us. We're going after them. Now, he's kind of reached a breaking point with the religious rulers, obviously. Now he's having a few problems with his own disciples learning the lesson. And it's almost to me, when you read, it's kind of like he's just marking time till they catch up. Come on, boys, or are we going to get it? He said, well, I don't know. Hey, you don't believe that. It, 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 you just follow what goes on. Because in the next chapter, chapter 16, Jesus is speaking you know, to the Pharisees. And there's this rebuke that goes out to them. And after he finishes that, he turns to the disciples and said, you need to watch out for those guys. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the scribes. In other words, they're full of hot air. That's what leaven does, by the way. You know, leaven is yeast. When yeast is put in bread, what does it make the bread do? It rises. Why does it rise? Because it's a chemical reaction that creates hot air. All right? He said the Pharisees are full of hot air. 
Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, says, hey, I'm getting ready to come back to Corinth. When I get there, we're going to find out about those who really walk in and those who are fully puffed up, full of hot air. And it's a good terminology because what happens when you choose to be a religious person and you just have information without the transformation going on, when you're just kind of going through the motions, but you know in your head, but you're not being obedient in your heart, there's a process of leavening that takes place in your life. And you look, you look good, you put on a good show, but what's coming out of your mouth is hot air. Well, don't look at me like that. Just full of hot air. You know, it sounds good coming out, and nothing, well, I love the smell of fresh bread bacon, don't you? That yeasty smell coming out of there. Hey, but it's about all it's good for. It smells good, at least in your nostrils. <laughs> but not necessarily in God's nostrils. And I don't want to stand before God. And I don't believe anybody here in their right mind wants to stand before the Lord one day and just say, yeah, arms, you're just full of hot air. That's all your life was. Now, I, you say the disciples are not slow to get the lesson. Catch what happens. Let me just read a little portion of it to you. And it says, and the disciples uh, came to the other side and had forgotten to take bread. Somebody left the baskets. And Jesus said to them, watch out and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they began to discuss among themselves, oh, because we took no bread. Oh, I forgot the bread. Did you bring the bread? I didn't bring the bread. Did you bring the bread? No, I didn't bring the bread. Oh man, we've had two miracles on bread and we ain't got it yet. No bread. And Jesus said, you men of little faith. I told him that last two miracles, hadn't he? You men of little faith. Why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not understand? Remember the five loaves, the 5,000, how many baskets took up? Or number two, the seven loaves and 4,000, how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I'm speaking to you concerning bread, but beware the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? They understand that he did not say to beware the leaven of the bread, but the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But this is so like us, is it not? He's trying to give them a lesson now about being where, but they're still lagging back at the bread line. You know, uh, we forgot the bread. What are we going to do now? Hey, if you forget the bread, it's okay. You had the bread of life in the boat with you. <laughs> if you forget the bread, it's fine. Because Jesus has just proven he can make bread. Lots of bread. If you need bread. Jesus is beyond the bread lesson. He's on the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees who are plotting his death. Watch out for those guys. Oh, we forgot bread. Now, I too often myself fall in this same category and be about a lesson or two behind. How about you? Just a lesson or two behind. Catch up. Get back in line. There's a greater lesson now. We're moving forward here. Let's quit staying in the same place. Spiritual life is spiritual growth. Spiritual growth provides progress. If there's no progress, then we're not growing. We're like the Corinthian church when Paul said, you know, when I first came to you, you were like babies, just only needing milk. You weren't ready for meat, but now you're not babies, but you're still acting like babies. You're not, you're not growing. You're not progressing. You're not moving forward. In other words, if we are where we were a year ago or two years ago in our spiritual life or 10 years ago, what is the matter? Why are we not growing? If all we're getting is more information, then we're just getting puffed up like a bunch of bullfrogs. Right? So the honest question is, what's the Lord teaching and why am I not getting it? He says, oh, you of little faith. Or, you know, why, why are you not getting it? And you talk about insecurity and inferiority of people. I mean, we can be this way. You know, Jesus is talking about something. He says, oh, we, we got something else going on. Have you ever walked into a room and somebody's kind of muffling to one another in the corner? And you think, oh, they're talking about me. Our insecurities kind of prevail in those moments. Oh, they're talking about me. Hey, they're not talking about you. How often have I reminded you? When you see people talking, most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're not talking about you. They're talking about themselves. In fact, most of them are like you, therefore they're not interested in everybody else. <laughs> they want you to know what's going on with them. What's happening here? What's happening in my life? What's going on with me? Oh, what about so-and-so? Oh, they just walked in. Hey, it's good to see you. Oh, I wonder what they're up to. 
Why are they talking about me? I, I see people come to church like that. You know, they walk out of church mad because I preached a sermon. He was talking to me. I do not read your email. I do not work for the government. <laughs> I'm not listening to your phone calls. I don't even know what your tax returns are. If somebody's dealing with your heart, then let him deal with your heart. Catch up. Get the lesson. Get on board. Get in line. There's too many good things that God's doing for us to be trailing behind on the bread lesson. It's time to move forward wherever God's sent. And praise God when you read this. Frankly, I'm always amazed at his patience at these points. I'm so, I know that the Lord sent the disciples out into the storm a couple of times, you know, by themselves. But I'm, I'm wondering if a couple of times he just tempted to sink the boat. <laughs> so let's start over. And I know he wasn't, you know, bear with me in my folly, as the apostle said. But praise, aren't you, praise God, aren't you glad he's committed to us? Aren't you glad he loves you the way he loves you? You know, aren't you glad it's more than three strikes and you're out? You know? The Bible says, he which began a good work in you, he will perform it. If it wasn't for that, you'd be dead in jail or in hell. Amen? One or the other, pick one. But he's not. He loves you and he's committed to you and he wants us all to get the lesson and to grow and to become more and more and more like him. So the big deal is, I guess I'd leave you with this morning, is what has God been trying to teach you? I mean, what does he want to change in you? What's he trying to work out in you? And, and if you're not getting the lesson, you know, it gets down to this. You're not believing. Oh, men of little faith. Oh, women of little faith. Oh, young people of little faith. What are you, what are you still hanging on to something when God's moving on down the road? It's time for you to move with him. And sometimes it's hard for us to understand that. We're so preoccupied with the lack of bread, we don't realize that we had the bread of life. It's like I said last week, it's kind of like saying, where are we going to get bread when you're talking to Jesus? It's like saying, I, I'm thirsty and you're standing in front of Niagara Falls. <laughs> you know, you have more water than you know what to do with, the fountain of living water. God's going to meet your need. He promised never to leave you, never to forsake you. He's not going to abandon you. And if we could just somehow take those tensions and the, the proneness to worry and turn that into prayer and intercession and trust God. It could well be you just need to take an inventory of where you're at in your life because we need to do this often, I believe. That we just take an inventory of where we are and what God's doing and what's God saying to me now. You say, well, God's not saying anything to me. That's probably because you're still back down 17 blocks down the road and you hadn't listened to what he said before. You need to go back there and listen. You need to go back and do what he said to do. You need to go back and respond. Because he's not going to change his mind about that, whatever it was. All right? You may justify it, you may excuse me, but he's not going to change his mind. If he said no, then it's no now. If he said yes, then it's yes now. All right? And you're, you're going to have to come to grips with that. Because in doing what he says to do, your life will blossom, it will flourish. God will do something glorious. But if you stay on the same course you're on in rejection, that's going to lead to more difficulty and more crisis and more troubles than you actually want to deal with in your life. It really, all the lessons get down to this simple lesson today. Am I going to trust and obey? Am I going to trust and obey? Am, am I really going to exhibit my love for Christ by believing Him? That's what the Lord desires for you more than anything else today. You just love Him enough to believe Him. You love Him enough to trust Him. You love Him enough to obey Him. So much so that it is manifest in your life, is exhibited in your character. Oh, that we might believe him. That's the cry of the hour. That's the need of our souls. Let's trust him. And in trusting, we'll obey him. Would you stand with your heads bowed?